أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين اللهم رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي رب زدني علما رب يسر ولا تعسر وتم بالخير ثم أما بعد الحمد لله السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Why is everyone so sad today? Is it cold outside? It's nice and warm inside, mashallah. Are you guys okay? Alhamdulillah. Good to smile. Smiling is a sunnah. And subhanAllah, we have so much to be happy about, isn't it? Especially nowadays when we look around the world, wallahi, we are enveloped in so many bounties of Allah. It would be unfair for us to not smile and not to be thankful for even one second. SubhanAllah. And Allah says, وَإِن تَعُدُّوا نِعْمَةَ اللَّهِ لَا تُحْصُوهَا If we were to begin counting Allah's ni'am, we can't even count them. And if one of you decided to be pious for Allah and to be obedient to Allah and said, yes, I am going to be able to thank Allah for the ni'am has given me. And I am going to do that by remaining in sujood from today until my death. Is that possible? It's not possible. If someone said I will be in sujood from today until Allah takes my soul away, it's not possible. But even if you did do that, even if you remained in sujood from today until the day you pass away and continue to say Subhana Rabbi al-A'la and Subhanallah wa bihamdi and Subhanallah wa bihamdi adada khalqi until the day you passed, guess what? Even then we would not be able to pay back Allah for one day's worth of mercies. The reason for that is, beloved brothers and sisters, With every second that passes, in one second you might say Alhamdulillah, might take two seconds. But with every second that passes, Allah has already enveloped you with trillions of mercies. Not millions and not billions, trillions of mercies. And these trillions of mercies are not throughout the entire universe. I am talking about trillions of mercies of Allah just within your own body. Allah says, وَفِي أَنفُسِكُمْ أَفَلَا تُبُصِرُونَ There are signs of Allah and His majesty and His power and His mercy within ourselves. Within a human body, there are trillions of cells and every single one of them have to work together in collaboration, in coherence for us to remain healthy every single day. There are the white blood cells, there are the red blood cells, there are these cells and that cells. If they're not working in the system, then you end up with clot, you end up with cancer, you end up with disease, you end up with bacteria, you end up with this and that. But every single day Allah is blessing us in so many ways and that's just within your body. And you look around, subhanAllah, the oxygen that you breathe, the air that you breathe is a favor of Allah. The ground that you walk upon, if Allah wanted, isn't it possible that he could have made the whole of the earth like quicksand? You know what quicksand is? Has anyone stepped on quicksand ever? Quicksand is not sand that you get to your house quickly. Quicksand is sand that eats you up very quickly. You step on it, you don't come out again. It swallows you up. If Allah wanted, every single inch of the earth could have been quicksand. If Allah wanted, all of it could have been rocky hills. If Allah wanted, all of it could have been oceans. If Allah wanted, all of it could have been desert. But Allah says, Allah. It is He, Allah, who has made the earth ذلول, flattened, lowered, subservient to you. So walk upon its shoulders, walk upon its corners. And consume from Allah's rizq, Allah's blessings, Allah's bounties. And to Him you shall return. So the fact that you're sitting today right now stable and steady in this masjid, Al-Hidayah Foundation in Keithley. The fact that you're steady right now and the earth is not shaking is a, is, is a mercy and a blessing of Allah. And so therefore, we can't even begin to count the blessings of Allah And the least we can do is be thankful. So can we all say, Alhamdulillah. This thankfulness is expressed in words. You've done that in Salah, mashallah. You've done that now in your talafud, bihamdillah, with saying Alhamdulillah. 
But the expression of gratitude is even more so with action. How? If Allah gives me a gift, then the way for me to show that I appreciate Allah's ni'mah is that I use that gift to worship Allah with it, isn't it? And Sheikh Munir was highlighting the importance of when Allah gives you Quran. And if Allah gives you Quran, that you use it to please Allah. And if Allah gives you a teacher to teach you that Quran, you appreciate that ni'mah that ni'ma by appreciating that teacher and honoring that teacher. And so our appreciation of Allah's ni'am is by talaffud, yes, alhamdulillah, subhanallah, wa bihamdihi. When you say it, the mizan, the scales are filled up because of good deeds on yawm al-qiyamah. When you say subhanallah, wa bihamdi, subhanallah, al-azim. You say those two phrases, the entire scale of your deeds fill up on yawm al-qiyamah just by saying subhanallah, wa bihamdihi, subhanallah, al-azim. Say subhanallah, wa bihamdihi, subhanallah, al-azim. So we appreciate Allah's ni'mah by words, but even more so by action. All of us happily, proudly say, Alhamdulillah, I'm a Muslim. But, but there's a but. The but is, I've said Alhamdulillah, I'm a Muslim, but how much of my life am I living as a Muslim? Alhamdulillah, Allah gave me Quran. Allah gave this ummah Quran. Kuntum khayra ummah. MashaAllah, tabarakallah, Muslims feel proud. We are the best of nations. Because Allah said in the Quran, you are the best of nations. But guess what? This ayah, you haven't completed it. He said, Kuntum khayra umma. What after that? Ukhrijat lin nas. Ya Habibi, you have a purpose to fulfill. You're not just the best of nation because your name is Ahmed and you drive a BMW and you are wealthy and you are healthy and you're strong and X, Y, and Z. No, you are the best of nation and from the best of nation by virtue, by virtue and because of you are following the Prophet Sallallahu and fulfilling his legacy, which is Ukhrijat lin nas. You have been brought forward for the humanity. We're not the best of nations because of my skin color, because of my name, because of my country, because of my ethnicity, none of that. We are only the best of nation if we fulfill the objective, the reason, the purpose of our existence, which is that we worship Allah and invite others towards the worship of Allah. Ukhrijat lin nas. We've been brought forth for humanity. Meaning we've been brought forth as examples, as ambassadors, as, as da'is, callers and inviters. So when I say Alhamdulillah for Quran, Alhamdulillah for Muslim, Alhamdulillah for Islam, Alhamdulillah for the Sunnah, that expression of gratitude with your zaban and your speech is good. But we must fulfill it with our action by living as Muslims. As you know, Islam is a complete way of life, isn't it? Islam is a thorough, complete from if you open the books of fiqh and Islamic law and jurisprudence, you will find that the scholars, when they talk about the various subjects of Islamic, uh, Islamic sciences, they start from the most basic of issues like the shahada, how to believe, the oneness of Allah, asma and sifat, what it means to be Muslim, what it means to be a mu'min, what it means to attain ihsan and so on. And then they discuss how to cleanse yourself, how to purify yourself, the bab of tahara, salah, all the way throughout the chapters, marriage, trading, transactions, politics, siyasa, foreign policy, how to engage with other nations, Islamic instruction and the Quranic legislation, the sharia system is comprehensive. And so for me to say, Alhamdulillah, I'm a Muslim, I need to observe Allah's rulings and guidelines and commandments in all elements and aspects of my life. Am I saying something wrong? Am I saying something right, inshallah? Okay. Inshallah, may Allah give us all tawfiq. Our discussion today is welcoming Ramadan. Some of us don't want to welcome Ramadan because it entails fasting, which is hunger and thirst and difficulty and qiyam and taraweeh. I watched a video recently of a man. Someone is asking him, brother, Ramadan is coming. Will you be fasting? I said, oh, brother, fasting Ramadan, days are too long. Oh, it's not really for me, not my cup of tea. I don't think I can fast this year. I think it's supposed to be humorous video. You probably watched it as well. Then they asked the man, oh, brother, Ramadan is coming. Will you be doing taraweeh, taraweeh this year, you know? 
It's very important. Qiyam of Layl is in the Sunnah. Will you be doing Qiyam of Layl? And Ramadan say, Oh, Akhi, Wallahi, you know, I would like to, but 20 rak'at, so long, Qiyam of Layl. After a long day of fasting, honestly, it's not my cup of tea. I'm not going to be doing it. So then they ask him, Brother, will you be having iftar, inshallah? He said, ah, At least I'm a Muslim, Akhi. How can I not have iftar? Suhoor and iftar, I'm Muslim. Of course I'll have iftar and suhoor. Fasting is too difficult, qiyam is too difficult, but at least, you know, suhoor, this is very easy. So sometimes, us, when we want to look for the ease in Islam, and there's, wallahi, Allah has made the religion easy. He has made it easy, ad-dunu yusr. And he has not made anything in our religion that's too burdensome. Allah says, ma ja'ala alaykum fi dini min haraj. There's nothing in our religion that's too much difficult for us to do. Allah will never ask us to do the impossible. And that's why when Allah commanded 50 salawat, remember that there was 50 salawat first. In the Layla of Isra and Mi'raj, when Allah, when Allah invited the Prophet ﷺ to meet, the, to, to meet him, the first instruction was 50, 50 waqt of salah. Then he went back down the heavens. Sayyidina Musa, who dealt with the Banu Israel, he knew what's going on. He knew this is too difficult. He said, go and beg Allah, ask Allah to make it discounted. He went back to him, became 45, 40, 35, 30, until he became five salawat. And then Sayyidina Musa said to him, go back again and ask Allah to reduce it even further. He said, I feel shy to go back to Allah again. So he accepted the five salawat, so we have five daily salahs. Now, if we were to complete the five daily salahs, is it too difficult? Let's be honest, is it too hard? Fasting once a month in Ramadan, 29 or 30 days, is it too hard? Realistically speaking, it's not too hard because for your daily living, you do much more difficult stuff. You're willing to work 12 hour shifts to have a nice house and a nice car and to put some food on the table and go for your annual holidays to the places that you like to go to. The reality is Allah has not made our religion too hard. The Prophet used to choose ease and the deen is easy. The reality is when our hearts are sealed and blocked and blockaded from the dhikr of Allah and the remembrance of Allah, then everything, even if it's small, seems like it's too hard for us to do. With Ramadan coming, our approach should be calibrated. When I think of Ramadan, what does it mean to me as a Muslim? Do I feel like, oh, it's a burden, man. Not again, bro. Love it. If that's the kind of mentality you're approaching it with, then we really need to have a good look at the mirror, close our eyes, and think about it. Why do I feel like this? When Ramadan, according to the hadith, is the leader, the leader of the other months, it's the month which is the most virtuous in its opportunity that it gives for you to acquire ajal and thawab. There is no month like Ramadan. I'll give you an example. I'm sure all of you have some non-Muslim neighbors, right? Okay. If I ask you to name me the 12 months of Islam, maybe some of you can, maybe some of you can't. Maybe some of the children that have heard the nasheed of Zayn Bika will say, Muharram, Safar, Rabi'ul Awal, Rabi'ul Thani, these are the months in Islam. And they say the nasheed, so they say the 12 months. Okay. But the reality is the most of us won't know the names of these months. But there is one month everyone knows. Even if you ask your neighbor John and say, John, do you know anything about Islam? Oh, I'm not sure. What do you know about Ramadan? He's oh, Ramadan. I know Ramadan. Everyone knows Ramadan. It's the most famous of all of the months. And the truth is, there are four sacred months and they are not Ramadan actually. They are Rajab, Dhul Qa'dah, Dhul Hijjah and Al Muharram. Ramadan is the leader of the other months. It's the Sayyid al-Shuhur. Because of the opportunities that it brings for us because of what it can do to you and your life in this life and also the next life. And so therefore, when I am thinking about Ramadan, and I'm talking about myself first, and then all of us also, my approach should be one of excitement. I should be feeling like, wow, a miraculous opportunity is coming for me that I can change everything in my life. Because the Salaf al-Salihin, the early Muslims, the pious predecessors, 
they used to await Ramadan and beg Allah to convey them to Ramadan for six months before Ramadan. And months afterwards, they would be making dua, oh Allah, accept anything that you have enabled for me to do in Ramadan. Because that's what Ramadan means. Ramadan, quite literally, my brothers and sisters, is the month of miracles. Is the month of what? Is the month of miracles. And the miracles of the month of Ramadan are so many. But the key and the foremost is the miracle of the Quran. And you might be thinking, well, Quran, what's the big deal? I have it on my shelf. There's so many qaris. There's always imams. What's the big deal about the Quran? Well, how is that a miracle? If I was to ask you, tell me some of the miracles of the Prophet Wasallam, you might contemplate and say, hmm, I know the Prophet Wasallam was invited to meet Allah in Laylatul Isra'i wal Mi'raj. Allah says, Subhanalladhi asra bi abdi laylan min al-masjid al-harami ila al-masjid al-aqsa. إلى المسجد الأقصى الذي باركنا حوله لنريه من آياتنا إنه هو السميع البصير Allah invited him to meet him beyond the seven heavens beyond سدرة المنتهى Allah invited him he went to a station even beyond the capacity and the ability and the jurisdiction of Sayyiduna Jibreel had to stop and say you alone complete the rest of the journey you might say this is indeed a miracle of the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم if I say, give me another example, you say, well, perhaps when the Prophet ﷺ came back to Mecca to Al-Mukarramah, the Qurayshis and the Mushrikeen, they said, how can you possibly have gone to Mecca, uh, gone to Bayt Al-Maqdis and come back just overnight? Describe it to us. Prophet ﷺ was only there for a few moments. He led the Salah with the Anbiya. He was offered the milk and the wine. He ascended to Mi'raj and came back. And he went back to Mecca with the Buraq that he was traveling upon. For him to remember all the minutiae and the details of Masjid al uh, uh, the Quds and the Masjid Al-Aqsa is not possible. So you might say to me, another one of the miracles of the Prophet Sallallahu is that when he was asked about the details of Masjid Al-Aqsa, the Prophet Sallallahu can't remember the details. What did Allah do to help his Prophet? Allah brought Masjid Al-Aqsa in front of him while he was still in Mecca al mukarramah and was able to point out the details of every single question they were asking about the Masjid Al-Aqsa and that was also a miracle. If I said, give me another example, you say, Allah is in the Quran. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Iqtarabati saatu wa shakka al qamar. The moon split asunder by the pointing of the Prophet as a mu'jiza, as a miracle of the Prophet. If I said, give me another, you say, well, perhaps you can take the example of the fact that the stones and the rocks and the trees would give salam to the Prophet when they would walk, when he would walk near them and over them. These are not myths, these are not fairy tales. These are truth recorded in the Sunan, authentically. If you go today to Masjid al-Nabawi sharif and if you go inside the Rawdah, if you're fortunate enough, or even outside, there is a pillar called the Ustuana, the pillar of the Anin, the crying tree. Does anyone know the history behind this crying tree? Yes, young man. Come to the front and tell me. MashaAllah, brave man. I love your top. Philistine. May Allah give freedom uh, and peace and protection to the people of Palestine. Say, I'm in everyone. Come, come, come next to me. Tell me your name first, brave man. Um, Arib. Arib. Tell, tell the people, yeah? Arib. So what's the story of this pillar of the crying tree? So the Prophet Sallallahu he used to um, lean on the tree whilst he was um, doing the khutbah. And then one day he didn't lean on it, and then the tree, um, the pillar, it was crying because he, he loved the Prophet Sallallahu that much, and it, he, it, he wasn't leaning on it. So. Takbir. 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 Come here, young man. MashaAllah, congratulations. Future Sheikh, inshallah. Arib, Arib's father should be proud. He's a very brave man. He came out and gave a, a mini talk right there. Look, that's the truth. The Prophet ﷺ used to lean on a tree to give the khutbah. After a while, the Sahaba said, the masjid is filled up, Ya Rasulullah, we can't see you from the back. So one of the Sahaba was a carpenter. He agreed to make him a mimbar, a pulpit. So the Prophet ﷺ stood on the pulpit and is giving the khutbah. All of a sudden, they hear a screaming, a crying tree. And it was the tree that the Prophet ﷺ used to lean on. The Prophet ﷺ got off from his mimbar and went and stroked it and said, calm, it's okay. And the tree stopped crying. This is not fairy tale. This is truth recorded, recorded authentically in the history of Islam. 
But then I say to you, Yo, oh brothers and sisters, these miracles you're narrating to me, but I can't feel them, I can't see them, I can't witness them myself. I tell you, you want to witness the biggest miracle of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, you don't have to go far. Open your phone, open your Mus'haf, you see the Quran. The Quran, every single letter in it, every single haraka in it, a, ba, ta, tha, ja, every single haraka, every single letter, every single word of the Quran is directly the speech of the Almighty. The value of the speech is valued by the speaker. You heard the name of this guy coming today from London to give a talk. Some of you decided to stay. Thank you very much. But if I told you, mashallah, tabarakallah, mufti mink is coming, you'd say, let's fill up the park. We need to build up an extra tent because the value of the speech is by the speaker, isn't it? Now imagine when the speaker is Rabbul Izzati Jalla Jalaluhu himself. And that's why the hadith says the speciality of the Quran over everything else is like the speciality and the honor and the dignity of Allah Rabbul Izzati Jalla Jalaluhu over everything else. Every letter of the Quran is the speech of the Almighty recorded in the Lawh al Mahfuz that he spoke pre eternally. Pre eternally means Time does not encompass it because Allah, Rabbul Izzati Jalla Jalalu, is pre eternal Himself. The Quran is the actual speech of Allah because of whose dignity and honor we're not even allowed to say that the Quran is created because it's from the attributes of Allah, Rabbul Izzati Jalla Jalalu Himself. Allah's speech, Allah is the light of the heavens and the earth. Allah Rabbul Izzah, the one whose names we memorize, the one whose junood and his armies and his soldiers, none can know except he. Allah spoke these words as the final testament, the final revelation after having revealed to Sayyiduna Adam and Sayyiduna Nuh and Sayyiduna Idris and Sayyiduna Sheed and Sayyiduna the Anbiya alayhim salatu was salam. How many did he send? Send he sent 124,000 prophets to every land and language throughout the entire world. And every prophet came to complete a part of that religion which was been perfected stage by stage. What Sayyiduna Nuh came with was then completed by the Anbiya that came thereafter. And that's why the Prophet Sallallahu said that my coming to the world is like the man who built a house magnificent and beautiful, but there is an empty brick. And the onlooker says, wow, what a magnificent structure, what a beautiful building, but where's that empty brick? And that empty brick is the coming of the Prophet Sallallahu the perfection and the completion of the Sharia and the Deen of Allah. So the Quran is the speech of the Almighty, which is the completion and the perfection of all of the other religions that have come before. Al Yoma Akmaltu Lakum Dinakum Wa Atmamtu Alaikum Ni'mati Wa Raditu Lakumul Islama Dina in Dina in the Allahi Al Islam. Allah is saying to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam after the final sermon that he gave in Arafah. In the Hajjatul Wida' the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam after having addressed the Sahaba when the completion of the religion has now been done when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has conveyed the message Allah reveals these ayat of Surah Al-Ma'idah that Allah has perfected for us our religion meaning all of the other Anbiya came with portions of it and this Quran came to perfect and complete it So the speech of Allah Rabbul Izzati Jalla Jalaluhu is nur, is light, takes us from darkness towards the light. And then he allows for sinful servants, insignificant individuals like you and I to, with, to, to behold and to witness, to look at it, to recite it, to memorize it, to learn it. There is no honor greater than that. The Quran is such that because of its magnificence and its nur and its beauty, Wherever it went, the Quran, right? Subhanallah. If I asked you, if I asked you, what's the greatest profession? What is the greatest profession in the world? Let's have a question time. What's the best job in the world? Brother, what's the best job in the world? Being a alim. What about you? Imam. What's the best job in the world, Yaqeen? 
Sheikh, similar, Marshall, this is a solid people. Sheikh, Alim, Mulana, all of that good stuff. Allah Mubarak. What's the best job in the world? Maybe like Formula One car driver. Maybe to be a pilot. I don't know. People have different ideas of what it means to have the best job in the world. What's the best job in the world? Now I'm talking to the young man in front of you. I'll come to you next. What's the best job in the world, do you think? Huh? Imam, mashallah, solid people. Yes, Akhi, what's your opinion? Imam, yes. Yes. That is correct because the Imam's job is what? In essence, it's to learn and teach the Quran, right? To learn and teach the Quran. We might think otherwise, but the reality is according to, the, according to Allah, according to Rabbul Izzati Jalla Jalal, the best of all jobs is teaching and learning, learning and teaching the Quran. Why is that? As we've said before, speciality of speech is value, is by value of the speaker. The Quran is the speech of the Almighty, recorded in Lawh al-Mahfuz. What happened in Ramadan? Ramadan, what happened was that this Quran that was preserved in the preserved tablet, Allah, after having revealed the previous books to the various prophets, the Torah, the Zabur, and the Injil, at their two due times, Allah now decreed that this is the time for the final testament to be revealed. In this interim, all of history is taking place. Adam is coming, alayhi salatu wasalam, Nuh alayhi salatu wasalam is coming, Musa alayhi salatu wasalam is coming, Sayyidina Yusuf is coming, alayhi salatu wasalam, and all of the, they are coming and they, they are doing their task and completing their prophethood. Allah now decides, Sayyidina Isa comes and goes and is, is lifted into the heavens and the Injil is revealed. The Prophet sallallahu is born in the year of the elephant. His grow, he grows up into his early years. His heart is cleansed. He grows to be a young teenager. He grows into his 20s, he's known as a noble person, the trustworthy al Amin. The Quraysh are trying to rebuild the Kaaba, they don't have a reliable person to rely upon to put the black stone back into its original place. They choose him because they trust him. Age of 25, Sayyidina Rasulullah gets married to Khadija radiallahu anha wa ardaha. He has his children, Qasim and Abdullah and his daughters. The Prophet is growing, but Allah's decree is timed. Inna kulla shay'in khalaqnahu bi qadr. Everything is precisely timed. Allah is watching. Allah knows when the time is correct. Six months before the Quran starts to be revealed, the Prophet starts to see true visions and true dreams. Whatever he sees comes to truth the following day. Months before the arrival of the Quran, the Prophet is retreating in the Ghar Hira. He goes up there into the cave of Hira and he's contemplating. For many days he spends. Khadija, his wife, radiyallahu anha wa ardaha, who was the first believer, the first supporter, the, 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 most, the, the biggest contributor to the deen from the earliest of stages after the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa She comes to Ghar Hira climbing. Have you been to Hira? It's a one-hour climb. She comes to Ghar Hira, climbs up there to convey to him his basic provisions, dates and food and otherwise. If any of you told your missus and your wife, I'm going to a cave to contemplate for a few hours, she'd be like, this man's gone mad. Police, go and get him quickly. Because the level of relationship and the trust that we have with our families, they know who we are. But the Prophet ﷺ, his honor and his dignity and his reliability was such that Khajid trusted him so much that he would go for many days and he would, she would fully support that. This is a virtue on his part and on her part. On one of these days, in the month of Ramadan, in the last 10 nights, on one of the odd nights, Sayyidina Jibreel comes and presents himself in front of the Prophet ﷺ in the form of a man. And he says to him, Iqra, recite. Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, Ma ana I don't know how to recite. I can't recite. I was not taught how to read, recite, or write. He said, Ma ana biqari. He, Sayyiduna Jibreel, grabs the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam tightly and squeezes him until he feels like he can't breathe anymore. And he lets him go and he says, Iqra, recite. He says, Ma ana biqari. I can't recite. And this repeats three times. Eventually, Sayyiduna Jibreel alayhi salatu wa sallam says to him, بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم اقرأ باسم ربك القل إنسان من علق اقرأ وربك الأكرم الذي علم بالقلم
علم الانسان ما لم يعلم the first five ayat of surah al-alaq the prophet sallam is scared he's worried this never happened to him before he's in a cave he's alone he starts to repeat this ayat with his tongue quickly trying to memorize it must be something significant and important allah azza wa jal confirms to him later on that there is no need for you to repeat and reiterate what you have just heard because لا تحرك به لسانك لتعجل به إن علينا جمعه وقرآنه when the prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم hears the Quran it is it is written onto his heart such that he cannot forget it anymore the prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم is shaken by the event he comes climbing down goes to his wife خديجة رضي الله عنها وارضاها and says زملوني زملوني دثروني دثروني cover me up shroud me up I'm so scared I'm so worried I don't know what's happened to me سيدنا رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم takes rest takes sleep and then when he wakes up after having recovered and recollected خديجة رضي الله عنها وارضاها asks him what happened he describes to her what happened he says, I am worried, I'm scared. Khadija radiallahu anha wa ardaha reconfirms and consoles him, comforts him by saying, You, my beloved husband, you, oh ya Muhammad, you are not someone that Allah will allow for you to be, Allah will not allow for you to be in a situation in which he is displeased with you. Allah will not turn you away. You are someone that maintains the ties of kinship. You are someone that takes care of the, the unfortunate. And you take care of the miskeen and the yateem. Allah will take care of you. Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, after having experienced the first revelation of the Quran, the seerah will tell you the rest of it. You can read a book of it and you must. Every single Muslim is a duty upon you to understand and learn the seerah of the Prophet ﷺ. Because it's a part of your iman to love the Prophet ﷺ, isn't it? That none of you truly believes until you love me more than your own family. Your children, your parents, you have to love the Prophet ﷺ more than all of your own family. How are we supposed to love the Prophet ﷺ if you don't even know his life story? So look into the seerah, read a book or two about it, and you will understand the rest of that story. The Prophet ﷺ, ﷺ, the revelation begins an ayah by ayah, section by section throughout the Meccan period throughout the Hijrah throughout the Medinan period the Quran over 23 years is revealed to the Prophet ﷺ. in this entire time every single letter of it is protected into the heart of the Prophet ﷺ. but at the same time the Sahaba are recording it and learning it from the Prophet ﷺ. from the first of them and the foremost of them Sayyiduna Abdullah ibn Mas'ud who says in honor and dignity that I have memorized from the Prophet ﷺ's mouth directly 70 surahs Seven to sort of from the Prophet's mouth directly. And that's why when you recite to a shaykh after having done your hifl, they say, Alhamdulillah, I've memorized the Quran. What do the Huffaz do next? They say, I want to get ijazah and sanad in it. I want a chain that connects me through my teacher and his teachers, 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 teacher. 23 up, the, up to from 29 to 30 to 31, 32 numbers. Eventually you find among them at the top of that chain, subhanallah, you find the tabi'un. Above them you find the Sahaba, alayhimur radwan. And from the Sahaba that you find in your ijazah, in the qira'ah of Imam Asim, and other qira'at, you find Sayyiduna who? Abdullah ibn Mas'ud. The Sahaba, like Sayyiduna Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, and Ali ibn Abi Talib, and other Sahaba, were around the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, capturing every word, every letter of the Quran. As he is reciting it, they are memorizing it, they are noting it, they are writing it down. And this is very important for you to know because there are those who try to put doubts into the heart of the believers saying the Quran was not preserved properly. And especially the qiraat and the dialects of the Quranic recitation. As you know, there are variants of the tilawah, the tilawah of the Quran. The Quran is the same, but the accent of recitation is different. Some, Quran, some Arabic tribes pronounce certain words differently. And I tried to give an example to bring the understanding near to your mind is us Londoners, we speak in a particular way. But the more north you go, the accent becomes more and more strange. What's happening, bro? I can't copy the Bromi accent or the Manchester one. But the point is, we, we understand that the mudud, the mud and the extensions of certain words, certain pronunciations, they become, we say bus, you say bus. What do you say, bus or, or, or bus, right? I'm getting a bus. Bus. 
bus, it's bus, say bus from today. It's the correct way. Come to the Haq brothers. We say bus, you say bus. And many other words will have differences in. The Arabic tribes had variants in their pronunciation. So one of the Qur'an says, وَالضُّحَى وَاللَّيْلِ إِذَا سَجَى Many of the Qur'an say like this. Other Qur'an say, وَالضُّحَى وَاللَّيْلِ إِذَا سَجَى مَا وَدَّعَكَ رَبُّكَ وَمَا قَالَى The Imala is there. These are variants in the Arabic dialects. Allah Rabbu Al-Izzati Jalla Jalalu taught the Prophet ﷺ how to recite in all of these different variant ways. And the Prophet ﷺ was teaching it to the Sahaba. Every single letter of the Quran was preserved without a shadow of a doubt in memory as well as in written scripture. The Quran was always preserved in writing and also in oral transmission. This is important for you to know. A few years ago, uh, some people found a, a manuscript of Surah Taha in Birmingham University. Do you remember? 2015. Some people said, hey, I guess when we found a Quran that's somewhat different to the Quran that you have, it predates all of these other Mus'hafs and it turns out to be at the time of the Prophet that must have been written at that time. At that time, this question was presented to one of the great sheikhs of our time for Qur'an. His name is Sheikh Ayman Suwaid. A Syrian scholar who graduated in Azhar has a PhD in the Qiraat and he is one of the giant scholars, the big scholars of the Qiraat and the Ulum al Quran in that time. So the question was presented to him Ya Shaykh, what's going on when we find that the Quran that we're reciting today, they're saying that with carbon dating it goes back to the Prophet and it seems to be somewhat different. How do we come to terms? The answer that he gave in a voice note, and alhamdulillah at that time I quickly translated in English and I sent it out to many, many brothers and many people benefited. He said that no, my brothers and sisters, the Quran was always preserved both orally and in writing. So now today, if somebody comes with another copy of the Quran that predates all of the other ones and says that this is the original one, we will say no. Because the Quran that we have today in the Mus'hafs, all of them are the same was always protected in oral transmission and also in writing. So the one you have needs to be reviewed, not the Quran that we have. Quran was preserved in speech by Allah's speech, in writing in Lawh al-Mahfuz. Sayyiduna Jibreel came, taught the Prophet ﷺ, was imprinted onto his heart and then from the Prophet's blessed mouth to the Sahaba into their parchments, into their stones, into their leaves, into their clothes, into their leather. They wrote it, they wrote it, they wrote it. And it was all preserved in memory and in writing. At the time of Sayyidina Abu Bakr al-Siddiq radiallahu anhu arda, what happened? They decided to collect the Quran into one book after the battle with Musaylama al kadhab the big liar who claimed to be prophet of the Prophet sallallahu And he even tried to make some Quran himself. You know that. You know Musaylama the big liar, he tried to come up with his own Quran. So he said, Al-Fil, Mal-Fil, Wa ma daraka Mal-Fil, Lahu khurtumun tawil. He's trying to copy Al-Qari'ah to Mal-Qari'ah to Wa ma daraka Mal-Qari'ah. Yawma yakunu al-nasu kal farash al-mabithuth. And he carried on. He tried to imitate, but it was mawdu'i, it was fabricated. Someone said to him, Ya Musaylama, oh mates, you know that I know that you know that you're lying. There is no similarity, there is no symmetry. The Quran of Rabbul Izzati Jalla Jalalu, the speech is pure. In the purest of Arabic form, it was preserved from that time. And the Sahaba then collected the Quran into one book, which became the original copy of the Quran. And then after that, Sayyidina Uthman ibn Affan recopied these Qurans into five, six copies. And then from there, the Quran was scattered in memory and in writing. And until today, that same Quran is with us. This Quran, beloved brothers and sisters, its power and its magnificence is such that it's nur, right? It's light. It's the speech of the Almighty. And just like, just like Allah is above and beyond everything else, so too is, is His speech above and beyond everything else. Wherever it goes, it brings with it speciality, honor, magnificence and nur. Ramadan is not a sacred month, but is the leader of the other months by virtue of the Quran because Allah says, شهر رمضان الذي أنزل فيه القرآن 
هدى للناس وبينات من الهدى والفرقان فمن شهد منكم الشهر فليصم ومن كان مريضا أو على سفر فعدة من أيام أخر يريد الله بكم اليسر ولا يريد بكم العسر ولتكملوا العدة ولتكبروا الله على ما هداكم ولعلكم تشكرون رمضان became the leader of the other, other, other months because of the Quran the Prophet وسلم, is the final, the seal of the Prophets, the leader of the Prophets, the Sayyid Walad Adam, whose virtue is connected to the Quran. Sayyiduna Jibreel is the leader of the angels, and his virtue, and his honor, and his dignity is connected to the Quran. This nation is the best of nations. Kuntum khayra ummatin ukhrijat lil nas. Why? Ta'muruna bil ma'roof, wa tanhauna anil munkari, wa tu'minuna billah. This amr bil ma'roof and this nahi anil munkar and iman billah is from the Quran. We are the best of nations by virtue of the Quran. The Sahaba are the best of generations by virtue of the Quran. The Tabi'een, the Tabi'een, the Salaf al Salihin are virtuous because of their proximity with the time of the revelation of the Quran. The city in which the Quran was revealed is called Ummul Qura, the mother of all cities by virtue of the Quran. Medina al Munawwara became the second sacred city by virtue of the revelation of the Quran. The Sahib al Quran, the Hamil al Quran, is the best of all people because the Prophet said, Kuntum khayrukum man ta'allam al Quran wa allama. The best of you are those who learn and teach the Quran. So, what does that show to you, brothers and sisters? What does that show to us? If I today want to test and see where I stand with Allah, are you with me, yeah? If you want to know how much Allah loves you, if you want to know how much Allah loves you, and how close you are to Allah. There is a simple test. Are you ready for the test? If you want to know how much Allah loves you and how close you are to Allah, simply ask yourself the question, how close you are to the Quran. The closer you are to the Quran, the bigger the sign that Allah is close to you, that Allah loves you, Allah wants to favor you, Allah wants to honor you. Because Allah's Prophet has said that the best of you are those who learn the Quran and teach it. And the hadith says, Allah has some ahleen, some special people among humanity. His special people who are Ahlul Quran. The people of the Quran, Ahlullahi wa khasu. They are the people of the Quran. And so now I say to you, as you welcome Ramadan, brothers and sisters, if you're going to prepare for one thing, then prepare to recalibrate, to revise, to correct our relationship with the speech of the Almighty, which came in this blessed month of Ramadan. Let me tell you one more thing, inshallah. My time is finished. I'll wrap it up. You know our dhunub and our sins, our sins act as barriers that stop us from going towards good deeds. Do you understand? When we commit sins, they block our hearts on the one hand, yes. They block it up. They seal it up. But they also hinder us from doing other good deeds. So the, 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 the pious people of the past, one of the key things they used to do when they used to come to preparation for the month of Ramadan, do you know what they used to do? Excessive istighfar and tawbah. Because when you do sincere istighfar and tawbah repetitively, then one, it unblocks the heart to receive the nur of the Quran. See that window? If it's completely dirtied with mud and not being clean for months and years, then even if it was the sunniest of days, the, 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 the light would not come in. Your heart is similar. If your heart is darkened with sins, then even if the Quran is being poured into your heart day and night throughout Taraweeh and Qiyamul Layl, it will not penetrate into your heart because it's been blocked with sins. Do you understand? So what we need to do, beloved brothers and sisters, in preparation for Ramadan, in welcoming Ramadan, is that we need to return to Allah with sincere istighfar and tawbah. Do you understand with sincere istighfar and tawbah so that we can maximize our ibadah in Ramadan but also benefit from the nur of the Quran that will be all around in the blessed month of Ramadan. Sincerely return to Allah with istighfar and tawbah. Ask Allah in sujood. Ask Allah in your qunut. Oh Allah, forgive me. Oh Allah, rectify my relationship with you. Oh Allah, correct my niyyah. Oh Allah, purify my intention. Oh Allah, make me sincere. Oh Allah, allow for me to Allow for me to enjoy worshipping you. Allahumma habbib ilayna al-Iman wa zayyinu fi qulubina wa kairihi ilayna al-kufru wa al-fusuqu wa al-asiyana wa ja'alna min al-rashidin. Oh Allah, guide me. Oh Allah, keep me steadfast. 
ربنا لا تزغ قلوبنا بعد إذ هديتنا وهب لنا من لدنك رحمة إنك أنت الوهاب Oh Allah, allow for me to attain taqwa, which is fear of Allah, consciousness of Allah, awareness of Allah, a relationship with Allah in the month of Ramadan. Yes, but that has to be preceded with a cleansing of the heart. So istighfar and tawbah and a, and a complete turning towards the Quran. If I was to end this today's talk with two pieces of advice for me and for all of you, is that for us to prepare for Ramadan, welcome it and to maximize his ajr and his, and his reward and his benefit. Number one, sincere tawbah. Number two, turning completely towards the Quran from now in recitation, in recitation, in memorization, in understanding, in contemplation, understanding i.e. tarjama, tafsir, in contemplation, thinking about what Allah has said, tadabbur in the Quran. And to practice what Allah has said in the Quran. Allah is saying, Aqimu salah wa atu zakat. Do salah, do zakat. You say, okay, I'll pray, but I won't give my zakat. That's how we are today. Allah says, Allah commands in the Quran, La taqrabu zina. Qul lil mu'minina yaguddu min abasarihim wa yahfadu furujahum. Tell the believing men and women to lower their gaze and their glances and to protect their private parts and their chastity. Wa innaka la ala khulukun azim. You are on the best of character. All of these instructions and injunctions of the Quran, we recite it, but we don't want to. Practice it. Then have I really listened to the Quran? Have I really accepted the Quran as my way of life? So yes, we welcome Ramadan. Oh Allah, convey us to Ramadan. Allahumma ballighna Ramadan. Say Ameen. We beg Allah to forgive our sins. Allahumma ghfil lana dhunubana wa israfana fi amrina wa thabbit aqdamana wa nsubna ala qawmi al-kafirin. And we beg Allah, oh Allah, allow for us to Worship you in the blessed month of Ramadan in a way that you forgive our sins and you accept us. Because very unfortunate is the one that receives the month of Ramadan and is not forgiven. So may Allah give us all sincerity, tawfiq, steadfastness, istiqama, and the true love for Allah. There is nothing better than enjoying the worship of Allah. If Allah grants you and I this gift of enjoying worshiping Allah, Allah and enjoying our moments with Allah in ibadah, then this is the biggest of gift of Allah. Walhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Jazakumullah khairan to Al-Hidayah Foundation and to brothers, Ustad uh, Rayhan and the Aiman and the Mashaykh and the management and to all of the beautiful brothers, youngsters and elders and the sisters upstairs for making this event today a success. And I also Shaykh, uh, thank and appreciate my Shaykh, Shaykh Munir as well for preceding this talk with his beautiful recitation and his advice. بارك الله سبحان الله وبحمده سبحان الله العظيم لا إله إلا أنت سبحانك إنا كنا من الظالمين حسبنا الله لا إله إلا هو عليه توكلنا وهو رب العرش العظيم اللهم صل على محمد وعلى اله واصحابه اجمعين اللهم ربنا ظلمنا انفسنا وان لم تغفر لنا وترحمنا لنكونن من الخاسرين رب اغفر وارحم وانت خير الراحمين رب اغفر وارحم وانت خير الراحمين اللهم اغفر لنا ما قدمنا وما أخرنا وما أسررنا وما أعلنا وما أنت أعلم به منا أنت المقدم وأنت المؤخر لا إله إلا أنت اللهم بلغنا رمضان اللهم بلغنا رمضان اللهم وبلغنا رمضان اللهم وارزقنا فيه الصيام والقيام اللهم اجعلنا ممن صام وقام رمضان إحس إيمانا واحتسابا ثم غفرت لهم ذنوبهم يا رب العالمين اللهم إنك عفو كريم تحب العفو فاعف عنا اللهم يا الله واجعلنا من أهل القرآن اللهم اجعل القرآن العظيم ربيع قلوبنا ونور صدورنا وجلاء أحزاننا وذهب همومنا وغمومنا اللهم وحفظنا القرآن اللهم واجعلنا من أهل القرآن 
اللهم واجعلنا ممن يحل حلاله ويحرم حرامه ويعمل بمحكمه ويؤمن بمتشابهه يا رب العالمين يا الله we ask you يا الله we ask you to forgive our sins يا رب العالمين يا الله we ask you to accept any ibadah that you have enabled for us to do يا رب العالمين يا الله we beg you to convey us to Ramadan يا رب العالمين Ya Allah, we beg you to make the most of this blessed month, Ya Allah, and make it the best Ramadan of our lives, Ya Rabbal Alameen. Ya Allah, make us from the Ahlul Qur'an. O oh Allah, bring us close to you with the Qur'an. Ya Allah, make your obedience beloved to us, make your disobedience disliked to us, Ya Rabbal Alameen. Ya Allah, forgive our sins major and our minor, Ya Rabbal Alameen. Ya Allah, help the Ummah of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam around the globe, Ya Rabbal Alameen. Ya Allah, help the people of Palestine and Gaza, Ya Rabbal Alameen. Ya Allah, protect them and provide for them, Ya Rabbal Alameen. Ya Allah, protect them and provide for them, Ya Rabbal Alameen. Ya Allah, help the Muslim Ummah around the globe, Ya Rabbal Alameen. Ya Allah, bring us all nearer to you, Ya Rabbal Alameen. Ya Allah, allow for us to continue to get nearer to you with our ibadah and our piety every day of our life until we meet you, Ya Rabbal Alameen. Make the best day of our life today that we get to meet you, Ya Rabbal Alameen. وصل اللهم وسلم على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين آمين